by inflammation and then airway damage. And this is a, a vicious cycle uh, which exacerbates already existing injury. And this leads to something called bronchiectasis. And bronchiectasis means that the airway walls are thickened, the airway diameter is dilated, and this further impairs mobilization of secretions. The other thing that happens with stagnant mucus is that it may become sticky and form plugs. And in that way, it may block airways and prevent ventilation of areas of the lung. And then surrounding areas of the lung will absorb air from that um, region and you will get collapse of the air sacs in that region. So here you have nice air filled sacs in the lung. They lose their air and they collapse. And it is very difficult to inflate these little air sacs again. And this is what atelectasis refers to. And you can see in this uh, chest X-ray here from a neonate, neonates with PCD often have atelectasis as a first sign. These white areas here are lung tissue that have lost air and collapsed. And I'll talk about treatment of that in a moment. The other thing about mobilization of airway secretions is that you will have heard, those of you who were able to join yesterday, um, two very good talks about physical activity and physiotherapy in people with PCD. And mobilization of secretions is in part or largely dependent on cough and forced expiratory maneuvers. Although um, if you talk about autogenic um, drainage for as a, as a physiotherapy technique, this is a more gentle technique and not so forced. But nonetheless, we are, patients with PCD are dependent on mobilizing their secretions instead of their cilia doing it for them. So we tend to use uh, normal or hypertonic saline in all patients when the, as soon as the diagnosis is suspected, but I don't think that this is universal practice. And the aim of this is to make the airway mucus less sticky and easier to mobilize and expectorate. And we use various solutions or strength of solutions for saline, which can be normal saline, so-called normal because it's the concentration of salt that is found within the body. And then we can use stronger solutions, which draw, the aim is to draw um, water or liquid into the airway secretions and make them less sticky and easier to mobilize. Um, our experience is that some children with um, primary ciliary dyskinesia have airways which are a bit more compliant or softer than normal. So in these children, we can give saline nebulizers together with CPAP to improve deposition. This is not evidence-based, but um, anecdotal. And some people, when they inhale very strong salt solutions, six and 7% solutions can get tight airways. And the administration of salbutamol or Ventolin before the uh, saline solution does help with this. And ideally we give um, inhaled saline or nebulized saline followed by th physiotherapy at least twice daily and increase the frequency as needed with intercurrent infections. Um, the other thing to say, I'm just going to move this a little bit about mobilizing airway mucus is that you would have heard about this yesterday, lung function, and this is work, early work from Andy Bush's team at the Brompton, they found that lung function was significantly improved after hard exercise. So exercise is good for you for, for that reason, but we also heard from Amanda Harris yesterday that exercise can be fun, and that's another way, another reason to, to do exercise, um, in addition to the fact that you mobilize airway mucus um, during um, intense exercise. We find with some patients that cough can be troublesome during exercise, and we advise them then to try mobilizing their secretions before exercise, and this does help in some people. And we also heard yesterday, and I won't dwell on this, that exercise capacity is reduced in people with PCD, their muscle strength is impaired, and therefore the level of activity, the level of physical activity is reduced, and all of this has an impact on quality of life. It's very important. But the good thing about this is that you can do something about it. So that training programs for build, building muscle strength and aerobic exercise capacity are an important part of PCD management. And also, I think as an adjunct that exercise does not replace physiotherapy. Um, it is uh, a conjunctive treatment.
But another thing I think that, that is quite difficult to know is, is when to treat with antibiotics. This is again, not evidence-based, but this is based on a consensus um, opinion where um, some experts in PCD met to discuss when antibiotic treatment should be indicated. And this was for use in clinical trials, but we also apply it to clinical practice. And when we talk about an exacerbation, what we mean is that it is a significant worsening of your respiratory symptoms. And here I must say that I'm not talking about upper airway um, symptoms here because we have a, a, a good long um, ENT talk following on from Anand Shah's talk. So I'm talking just about the lower airways here and in my whole talk. So an exacerbation is a significant worsening of symptoms. And we recommend antibiotic treatment with three or more of the following. That's increased cough, an increase in the sputum volume or a change in the color. You can see all the different colors of sputum that you can have ranging from what are clear secretions with a bit of color to frankly purulent or pussy secretions and sometimes tinged with blood. So an indication to start uh, antibiotics was all, would also be the doctor feeling that antibiotics were needed or perhaps the patient feeling that antibiotics were needed. Uh, systemic symptoms such as malaise, tiredness or fatigue. Hemoptysis is definitely an indication and a fever. And then I suppose the next question might be, how long do you wait with these symptoms? And there is no clear consensus on that, but probably about two to three days or earlier, depending on the severity of the symptoms. The other thing to say is that it's we try as often as possible to always take uh, a sputum culture or a laryngeal aspirate, uh, but we do not wait for the culture results before starting antibiotic treatment. We start antibiotic treatment and then adjust the antibiotic treatment based on the culture results if that is needed. And the usual duration of treatment is two weeks. Again, this is not evidence-based and there will be um, ongoing research into this, whether or not shorter courses uh, will be appropriate, but for, for now to try and um, reduce the incidence of antibiotic resistance, if you like, and to treat the infection, um, we recommend two weeks of therapy. Um, and when to start antibiotic prophylaxis, I will just mention the first uh, randomized double-blind clinical trial in uh, PCD, which was published in the Lancet Respiratory Medicine in 2020. And this was uh, a control trial looking at the use of azithromycin um, versus placebo in patients with PCD. And it was a six month uh, study. And essentially what the study found was that the number of exacerbations in the azithromycin treated group was halved without evidence of emerging bacteria. Now there is another study published um, by Anne Chang, which was published in CHEST uh, in August this month, looking at patients who have bronchiectasis is due to a variety of causes and over a longer treatment time, and they did find the emergence of bacteria, but we haven't seen that yet with the studies that have been done just in PCD. And you can see here that um, patients treated with azithromycin had a bit more of a runny tummy, but that did not lead to a higher dropout rate. So what about azithromycin prophylaxis? So prophylaxis means treatment continuously to try and prevent exacerbations. This is based on the ERS or European Respiratory Society guidelines for the management of bronchiectasis in children and adults to consider azithromycin prophylaxis when there are three or more exacerbations. So yes, in a 12 month period. And this is not part of the recommendation but is used in other patients with bronchiectasis who have infection with pseudomonas um, to consider azithromycin treatment as well. You can consider a trial of treatment for six months to see if it is effective. Consider taking a break in the summer when we know that infections um, are less likely, that we screen annually for the emergence of other bugs such as mycobacteria, which may emerge irrespective of treatment and that we try and take three monthly sputum cultures and with exacerbations as a standard of care. Now, just briefly, what is uh, Pseudomonas? Um, Pseudomonas you may have heard of is a bug that uh, is commonly seen in adults with cystic fibrosis, but it does occur also in patients with PCD. Pseudomonas is a bug that we find everywhere in the environment, but it doesn't infect people with healthy lungs. 
So for that reason, infection control is important um, in outpatient clinics for PCD patients, if it is possible to segregate, but it's not always possible, but you may have take your patients with pseudomonas on a different day. And another thing is to say that pseudomonas loves swimming pools, so that if you're somebody who uses an indoor swimming pool, it's important to make sure that the people who manage a swimming pool check at least weekly for the presence or absence of pseudomonas. The thing about pseudomonas is that it's very good at evading host defenses. It has a, a variety of mechanisms, including these tails and pili hair or hairs. Pseudomonas, they talk to one another and they function as a community and they gang together and they say, how can we develop resistance and how can we avoid being eradicated? So it can be difficult to rid of, but our experience in patients with PCD is that it is easier to get rid of than it is in cystic fibrosis. But we do know from adult work or adult studies in PCD, and perhaps Anand will talk about this, is that in adults, it is associated with worse lung function. And another thing to say is that we always treat the first growth. We don't wait and see if pseudomonas goes away because it doesn't go away. Just because you can't isolate it doesn't mean to say it's not there. So even if we isolate it from the nose, the upper airway and not the lower airway, we will treat it. And we treat it um, with a, a variety of treatments. Um, this is not standardized, but this is what is in use currently for acute or first growth of pseudomonas aeruginosa, oral ciprofloxacin followed by inhaled, that at the same time as inhaled tobramycin for a month. And this is nebulized, not dry powder. New culture within two weeks of stopping. The patient is unwell or very young. We tend to admit them to hospital for intravenous antibiotic treatment. And with chronic infection, we treat either with um, inhaled topramycin on alternate months, inhaled toby and colistin on alternating months, inhaled colistin every month. The other thing to say is that these treatments are not licensed for treatment for PCD patients because there isn't a diagnostic code for PCD. So we use the diagnostic code for bronchiectasis, which is J47, and we have no problem prescribing these drugs. And just briefly, atelectasis, um, again, this is not evidence-based. And if you look at the literature for how to manage atelectasis in anybody with atelectasis, it's very scanty. Um, we know that patients with PCD are more likely to have atelectasis than patients with CF, for example. So what we do is intensify the treatment with hypertonic cellular nebulizers and physiotherapy, antibiotics, often intravenously, and bronchoscopy if there is no improvement. And then you may ask, how long do we wait before, before we do a bronchoscopy? And again, that must be individualized, but we wouldn't wait a month, for example. It should be done within a week to two weeks. Pulmazyme is something that you've probably heard of, which is used in cystic fibrosis to make the airway mucus less sticky. And it may be used on a case-by-case -case basis in PCD, but again, there are no studies in PCD and we do need these studies. So just finally looking at immunizations and annual review, we recommend annual influenza vaccination. 23 valent pneumococcal vaccine once the child is finished with childhood immunizations. Follow up at least three monthly of all patients and probably more frequently in infants. Take cultures both from the nose and the larynx or expectorate sputum. And annual review um, yet yeah, once a year and with a physiotherapist to review the patient, a nurse and a doctor to review the patient, dietitian, psychologist and social worker, access to these um, specialists if they are needed, lung function, always chest x-ray, CT scans, I haven't discussed and perhaps Jane Lucas will discuss those in her talk, but chest CTs are done on an individual basis and perhaps once or twice throughout childhood, but will become more frequent um, with lower doses and blood tests. So in summary, mobilization of secretions is a cornerstone of PCD management together with early treatment of infections. Consider a program of physical exercise and strength tra training, treat airway infections early, regular sputum culture, and individualize the treatment. And we need more clinical studies. Thank you very much from me. 
So I'm now really pleased to uh, um, introduce um, Anand Shah from, um, he is a consultant respiratory physician at the Royal Brompton, which is now part of Guy's and St. Thomas's NHS Trust. Um, he's also a clinical senior lecturer at Imperial College London, and he works with adult cystic fibrosis and PCD patients. He has a special interest in fungal lung disease, and particularly that's caused by Aspergillus fumigatus. And I hope I said that properly. Almond. So over to you if you're ready and re raring to go. Thank you, Fiona and Suzanne, uh, for your prior talk. Let me just see if I can share my screen. Um, all right, so thanks very much. And um, I'm going to talk about PCD from an adult perspective, which, as you'll see from my slides, is very similar to adult um, to pediatric PCD. Um, and again, as Suzanne was saying, a lot of this is unfortunately not evidence based. Um, so a lot of this is based on consensus practice or expert opinion. Um, and the similarities are very, very, uh, are very kind of there for pediatric disease as well. But there are perhaps some unique aspects and where there's perhaps some difference. And as people get older, the individualized aspect is becomes quite important. So I'm just going to start off um, in terms of the, the structure of the talk. I'm going to start with a clinical case just to give you an idea of what we often see. Um, and then go through the management. Uh, and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, the clinical course, because obviously I'm sure a lot of you are interested in terms of what does PCD mean as you get older? What's the trajectory as as you know life goes on? Uh, and I can hopefully give some insight into that. Uh, and then touch on briefly in terms of what, what we need to do um, moving forward. So this is just a case of a 35 year old lady who was referred to our center, which we had a lot of referrals for, for individuals with bronchiectasis who had recurring infections and was chronically colonized with Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which you've um, heard of in the last talk is a, a bacteria that we particularly are concerned about in the context of bronchiectasis. Um, the, if you go back through the childhood history, there was evidence of neonatal respiratory distress. So what I mean by that is soon after birth and um, their troubles with their breathing, um, they had a childhood history really littered with lots of ear infections, grommets, um, inflammation of the ear canals, sinus infections, and really has had cough and sputum as a child um, throughout, but unfortunately hasn't been referred until the age of 35. Uh, and this is a CT scan. So this is a slice, uh, so it's a cross-sectional slice of the lungs. And what you can see there is evidence of bronchiectasis. And if you can see my cursor screen here, um, but there's some evidence of bronchiectasis screen at various sites within the airways. Uh, and you can see evidence of mucus plugging uh, in the smaller airways as well. Um, now, I'm sure you probably had some talks with regards to diagnostics for PCD. So one of the, we do, I'm not going to focus on that in this talk, because I'm sure there's other talks that are going to go through it in much more detail. But just to reiterate um, the process that we would go through. So we do a number of different tests, uh, including some nasal nitric oxide measurements, um, some nasal brushings to look for the actual cilia and how they move. Uh, and then we look at those under a very powerful um, microscope called electron microscope, where we can actually look at the structure of the cilia. Now, we did all of those things and we've confirmed the diagnosis of PCD based on a constellation of those findings, showing cilia that don't move, uh, ultrastructural abnormalities in terms of the cilia uh, and a supportive nasal nitric oxide as well. So that really confirms the diagnosis of PCD. Um, so what do we do at that point um, and how do we approach the management of adults with PCD because unfortunately a significant proportion of the patients that we see are diagnosed actually within adulthood rather than necessarily diagnosed within pediatrics and transitioned through to adult uh, care. So as you've heard already we know that uh, PCD is a multi-system disease it affects many different organs in the body it can affect the ears and the lungs uh, given the cilia that um, go all the way through the airway tracts, uh, and it can also affect the reproductive system as well. Um, and in more rarer cases, it can affect other parts of the body as well in terms of the, the heart, etc. Um, and also you can have situs inversus or situs ambiguous, so where there's kind of a shift in the organs as well. So if you look at um, the clinical picture, um, very often in adults with PCD, if you go back in, into the history, there's evidence of neonatal respiratory symptoms. They've had a wet or productive cough or recurrent chest infections throughout their childhood. Um, and within, um, you know, kind of PCD world, almost invariably there's evidence of rhinitis or sinus disease as well uh, and ear infections. Uh, and then more rarer features that you, you know, we don't see all the time, but it's important to be aware of because it's important to screen for them. Uh, would be some evidence of cardiac abnormalities congenitally, uh, sometimes 
more rarely abnormalities in the brain or in the eyes as well, but they're much more rarer, but it's something just to be aware of. So how do we manage this? And I think the key here really is it's broadly similar to what we do in a non-CF, a bit of a typo there, sorry, non-CF uh, bronchiectasis population. So we have a lot of patients that have bronchiectasis from a number of different diseases. And the, the approach is broadly similar. Um, and again, it's very broadly similar to pediatric management as well. I think the key is because it's a multi-system disease, we really should and do have a multidisciplinary team approach. So that would characteristically involve obviously the, the clinicians, uh, nurse specialists who can perform a, a lot of engagement and the day-to-day -day contacts with, with individuals with PCD. Um, physiotherapy, we've heard, is incredibly important. Um, dietitian is can be important, not always, but it can be important. Um, ear, nose and throat specialists, we've heard, are incredibly important. Uh, and then close links with fertility specialists as um, obviously get into adulthood uh, and other teams as and when they're required. So they're not permanent members of the staff, but you have teams that you can get involved as and when necessary. Um, so this you've already heard um, in terms of the Peter Cole's uh, hypothesis in terms of the vicious cycle. And this is a variant off that really. So in terms of what we think is happening is that there's an abnormal cilia gene, which causes dysfunction of the way it works. Uh, and because it's not shifting that mucus clearance, it leads to impaired clearance and mucus obstruction. And that's really where you get the um, this kind of vicious circle or vortex, is, as it's called, in terms of an interchange between obstruction, infection, inflammation, and then over time, the development of bronchiectasis. And that over time, again, can lead to abnormal lung function. And without management and without treatment, um, that can uh, essentially eventually lead to respiratory failure. Now, obviously, the hope is that if we intervene successfully uh, at this point here, uh, we can prevent significant deterioration in lung function and obviously prevent respiratory failure, but that will be the natural progression without good management. So we've heard about the importance of physiotherapy, and I'm, I'm going to try and not repeat entirely everything that was said in the last talk, although, you know, I think it would all more or less hold true. There's some little bits that I think as you get into adulthood are incredibly important. And the first thing I would say is that there's a, there is a real big heterogeneity. What I mean by that, there's a variety of diseases that you see in terms of PCD, as with any other disease, and that can be related to genetic uh, and also, you know, to past history. So sometimes if you have a significant infection, that can lead to more severe scarring. Whereas you have other individuals with PCD that really don't have a lot of structural lung disease. Uh, and so we take a very personalized approach to physiotherapy. I think physiotherapy is always required um, because of the nature of the disease in terms of, you know, the inability to clear secretions. But what that actually involves can be quite variable depending on an individual person. Now, as you get older and individuals have more, uh, are more adept at doing their own physiotherapy, we do tend to use a lot more devices in physiotherapy. And there's some, uh, some very recent evidence, or one of the, I think two or three randomized control trials that have been performed in PCD, which looked at these types of devices, so oscillatory positive pressure devices. Um, and there's a variety of them on the market, which you may or may not have come across, showing that potentially they may be a bit more superior in certain cases to conventional chest physiotherapy. And, and there's something that I'm sure the physiotherapist will talk through as, um, in, in some of the other talks as well. But as you get older, that's something that can assist uh, your clearance. Um, and as we talked before, mucolytic therapy. Uh, and again, this is something that we do much more targeted. So we don't use this uh, invariably in everyone. And I think um, seeing on the, the chat, there was a question about what if it over loosens the sputum. And I think our approach would be, we do a physiotherapy session first uh, and really examine the sputum and how difficult it is to clear, have a look at the, at the CT scan. Is it full of mucus? Uh, that is, you know, not being cleared effectively, or is it actually pretty clear? What does the sputum look like? You know, does it look very sticky and um, and congealed, uh, and hence it would benefit from a mucolytic therapy, or is it actually quite loose and and you know the individual is clearing it very effectively without the requirement of mucolytic therapy? So we take a much more targeted, individualized approach. Um, we don't do, you know, you can do much more scientific measurements of sputum in terms of their rheology is what it's called in terms of how viscous it is. And we don't do that in a regular clinical setting. So it's much more subjective. Um, but our physiotherapists really, really lead on that. And we take their advice in terms of when we think the mucolytic therapy would be useful. Uh, and then there's a post um, post uh, um, commencement assessment as well. So, you know, can you tolerate it? Is it making you tight or wheezy? Um, and is it physically helping um, the the clearance uh, and also we bear in mind that you know as life goes on and life gets busier uh, you know you're juggling families work 
Um, obviously, adding in nebulized therapy into a day-to-day -day setting has a treatment burden effect as well. And so all of these things we have to weigh up uh, in terms of what we think is the right approach for each individual. Um, we tend to use, in our experience, we tend to use 7% um, sodium chloride, but that's really where the evidence base is in the cystic fibrosis literature, which we translate across. Um, but that, you know, at the moment is still based on evidence in other diseases, and there hasn't really been um, clear evidence in PCD. There's a very sm one very small study, which was a crossover between normal saline and, and hypersonic saline, which didn't really show it a, it was quite small, didn't really show a significant outcome. Uh, and I think further studies are still clearly required. Um, move on. So in terms of infection management, and this is the paper that is really a kind of a landmark study, um, which was Suzanne was talking about in terms of um, the use of azithromycin. Um, so if you look at individuals with bronchiectasis in general, what we know from the literature in that context is it's really the people that are exacerbating frequently, um, which do worse over time, which you think is, is really common sense in the sense that people that, that are having more infections, if you go back to the original hypothesis where you have infections leading to inflammation, leading to damage, um, obviously the individuals that are having more infections and more exacerbations are the ones that are having more issues over time. Um, and it's really in that context um, that azithromycin has been used in that setting. Now, in this randomized controlled trial, it really wasn't stratified based on infection frequency. So this was all comers. Um, and it was a mix of pediatric and adult populations, relatively small numbers as clinical trials go, but it was still really interesting to see a significant effect in terms of the probability of, of not having an exacerbation. Now, um, it, it, you could think on the back of that, you should give this to everyone uh, because that's essentially how the randomized control trial was performed. Now, that's not what we do in an adult setting. Uh, and there's perhaps a couple of reasons for that. One is, um, Again, if you extrapolate from other conditions, as Suzanne alluded to, um, there is evidence now that after a couple of years, at least in, in non-cystic fibrosis bronchiectasis, you do tend to get a waning of effect. You can get the emergence of other populations and you can get antimicrobial resistance. Uh, and obviously any antibiotic has evidence of, uh, or can have problems with toxicity as well, particularly with azithromycin. Um, one of the things to be wary of is it can cause um, hearing loss. Uh, it tends to be more of a problem in the older population group. Uh, but again, all of these things um, you have to bear in mind. And given, as we probably will hear in the next talk, a significant proportion of individuals with PCD will have abnormal hearing to begin with. Uh, this is perhaps something just to kind of keep in context in mind. So in our approach, we tend to, as Suzanne has already alluded to, use this in individuals who are really having two to three exacerbations a year, despite optimization of their physiotherapy. Um, and then in that context, we use it again, thinking about treatment breaks over the summer period. Uh, because there tends to be less you know, viral infections around at that time, which is often a trigger for the exacerbations. Um, and um, if not, it doesn't mean you can't use it year round, but, but that's what we try and achieve. Um, and then revisit and, and screen on an annual basis to make sure that we're not having emergence of any other um, illnesses. And certainly before we start it, to make sure there's no mycobacterial um, infections there. Um, in terms of other antibiotics that we tend to use, so we did talk about Pseudomonas aeruginosa with Suzanne, and we certainly would aim to eradicate it um, at the time of acquisition or if it hasn't been eradicated before. Again, there's probably not consensus in terms of how's that, how that is done. We have a similar approach uh, in terms of intravenous antibiotics um, if oral antibiotics aren't successful for two weeks. And then we tend to use three months of nebulized colomycin. There will be variability um, because of the licensing of these drugs and the availability around different European countries. Um, in the UK, um, for chronic maintenance therapy, uh, we would, if, and again, and this is a, something to bear in mind. So if you have chronic pseudomonas aeruginosa, azithromycin perhaps is still something that you can use and is very successful with good evidence base uh, in other disease groups. If we feel that it's not working as effectively or it's, uh, you know, for whatever reason, not indicated or not possible to use, we would tend to use nebulized antibiotics such as nebulized colomycin, uh, because that is what is readily available to us in the UK. Um, other nebulized antithelial antibiotics, which are used in cystic fibrosis, such as tobramycin and astronam, aren't licensed outside of the CF setting. And unfortunately, it's not something that we're readily able to obtain in an adult setting. However, that may be different in other in other countries. Um, but bear in mind, again, that this is all evidence based coming from um, a more general bronchiectasis literature uh, or cystic fibrosis. So none of these uh, medications, unfortunately, have been trialed specifically in PCD. Um, but I think it's reasonable to extrapolate that they um, can work and be helpful in, in PCD as well. 
Um, so I'm not going to spend too much long uh, time on this because it is, you obviously have a dedicated talk thereafter, but it's just really to bear in mind that it's, it's, it's really something that you should never forget in terms of the sinus disease because, you know, again, from a very simple non-ENT person, if you have sinuses full of bacteria and full of um, phlegm, for want of a better word, you then lie down at night, you know, that's all going to drip down into your chest. And it can really be a driver in terms of exacerbation of frequency uh, and mucus sitting in the chest. And if you um, look at some of these studies that have been performed, um, there really is evidence of sinus disease in a significant proportion of individual adults with PCD. Uh, and there's been some nice studies showing that the bacteria that you can get within the sinuses are very similar to those that you get in, in the chest. And often it, it may be the first route of entry uh, in the sinuses, which can then lead to colonization in the chest. So it's really important. Um, this is a just a snapshot of medical management um, of sinus disease and PCD. And you can, it, it's a combination of local therapy, irrigation, nebulized antibiotics or surgery. Um, but I'm going to move on because I don't want to step on the, the next speaker. Um, moving into adulthood, obviously one of the key things, and it's really important um, and often perhaps something that we um, we perhaps shy away more than we should do in terms of discussing at the point of diagnosis, because often it's on people's minds, you know, very early, or perhaps it's not on their minds because they haven't really thought of the implications or they're not aware of the implications, uh, is fertility. Um, so around 75% or there or thereabouts of, of men with PCD are infertile, and that can be due to a variety of different reasons. reasons. Um, they can have decreased motility, they can have low sperm counts or morphological abnormalities, and that's really to do with the fact that cilia are really important and are, 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 are kind of a key, key factor in sperm uh, structure and how they swim. Um, and so from our perspective as clinicians and who aren't fertility experts, um, then really when we have the diagnosis, it's really important to tackle this head on and inform um, about the implications in terms of fertility, but also the fact that, look, this isn't insurmountable at all. Um, this is something that just requires referral to a fertility specialist uh, and to reduce that anxiety so that actually when they are thinking about starting a family or having those conversations, they know that they can come back and talk to us and we can refer them early to have discussions with experts so that they can actually have the appropriate tests done uh, and really um, understand what the implications may or may not be uh, for them as a family. Um, the cilia, interestingly, are, are also uh, similarly um, present in the fallopian tubes with, with, with and structurally in the fallopian tubes are very similar to the respiratory tracts. However, um, females with PCD are not usually infertile. Um, and this perhaps is a reflection of the male dominated kind of medical field, but there's been very, very, very little work done in terms of the implications in female fertility. And, uh, you know, it's something that looking through the literature, there's hardly anything there. So it's certainly something that requires more, um, more analysis. But uh, from a implication perspective, um, it's not usually a problem, but again, it's something to think about if there are any issues. And obviously, again, referral to a facility specialist would be key. And I think as centers, I think the one thing I would take away is really the PCD, thankfully, should be managed in an adult specialist center where we have appropriate um, links to the necessary specialists who have an interest in PCD, because not every fertility specialist perhaps uh, will see so many individuals with PCD. So I think concentrating that expertise is incredibly important. Um, so moving on to kind of what, what it means um, for adults with PCD. So um, we did some work quite, it's quite a few years ago now, actually. Um, at the time, there was very limited prospective data and it was either cross-sectional. Uh, and really what we wanted to do was look retrospectively, but to see what happens over time uh, in adults with PCD. So this is kind of a cohort that we developed at the Royal Brompton uh, Hospital. Um, and this was going back to 2016 now. So gosh, it's... Um, when I looked a bit more youthful. Um, and we had 150 adults at the time, about 38% of which were male. Uh, and you can see that we had a real spread of age of PCD. People tend to think uh, or assume that PCD is a, a pediatric disease, or you know, when you imagine someone with PCD, you think of someone who's very young, but actually we had individuals going up to 75 with PCD. Uh, and in terms of the age of diagnosis, uh, that can vary from birth um, all the way up to you know 70s. Um, so it's something that you know is probably a reflection of our 
at the time at least um there wasn't specific adult commissioning and you know hopefully things have improved but the route in terms of getting a diagnosis as you'll see in a minute um is incredibly important and we're perhaps not as good as we should be in terms of diagnosing it at an early stage um and our mean age of or median age of diagnosis was, was in the sort of early 20s uh, and the median lung function um, at the time so the way we measure that in, in most part is the forced expiratory volume in one second and so how much air you can breathe out in one second was around 70 percent of what it should be at the time of diagnosis so this isn't after pcd specific management this is actually before you've even been diagnosed um and it, effectively lots of different genetic um of structural defects um and it, it, this is kind of looking at where in the lung it affects and predominantly it's in the middle parts or the bottom parts of the lung uh, and that gives you some idea in terms of etiology uh, although it's not specific um and this is again just a um a snapshot of lung function over time at the point of diagnosis and also the different bacteria you get um, at time of diagnosis and again what's what i think is a really important take-home message is that the later that you're diagnosed um the lower your lung function is um and it really reinforces the point of making of trying to achieve diagnosis at an early stage so you can really institute appropriate management and so what we found is that the older that you are the lower your lung function is which is perhaps perhaps something that you would expect, but also you tend to be more likely to be colonized with pseudomonas. And these are bugs that um, we think are important in terms of um, disease. Um, what's um, reassuring in terms of, if you look at the, um, the time that we're following these patients up is probably about seven years. So it's, you know, it's variable and it's, it's a kind of a, a snapshot for want of a better word. Um, but once they're diagnosed, actually the decline over time is actually better than what you see with individuals with non-PCD bronchiectasis uh, and also better than what you see with cystic fibrosis. So I think that's relatively reassuring. Um, there is a, 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 mor a mortality, so that these individuals sometimes do die, but that we're talking about a big range of diseases with varying ranges of severity over a long period of time. Uh, and, you know, that's something that unfortunately, hopefully uh, we can try and reduce as time goes on with more intensive management. Um, what was interesting is that the progression, once you've, once you've actually diagnosed them, then actually the progression isn't influenced by the age of diagnosis. So it's not as if if you're diagnosed late, you're forever going to be in trouble. Uh, actually, that's not the case. When you actually diagnose, um, it's then not influenced by the age of diagnosis, or even if you have pseudomonas either. So um, I think that hopefully, and this is, you know, again, retrospective data so with all the limitations that that has, it hopefully supports the fact that if you can diagnose early, we can actually prevent that deterioration over time. Um, and actually, the only thing that we really found was that the, um, the effects over time can be dependent on genetic um, or structural defects. So if you have microtubular defects in terms of the structure of the cilia, that tends to do worse over time and we're not exactly clear why yet um, and that's something that's similarly been seen in, in a pediatric population um, the other thing which again is perhaps unsurprising is that the amount of bronchiectasis and the dilatation you have on your ct scan does predict how things are, are going to develop over time so the more less so the, the age of diagnosis but the extent of disease that you have at the time of diagnosis will predict how much things deteriorate over time because perhaps that damage has already been done and difficult to overcome so you really want to try and um, target this early uh, and that's just some um, uh, slides showing the different structural defects and the deterioration over time. Anand it's uh, Suzanne oh sorry yeah, I was just sorry. about to say we're running out of time I'm really enjoying your talk. No that's just... all right so I'm going to I'm going to wrap up very quickly okay. then so just Thanks. to summarize um, so I think the key thing that I won't go through all of them but the key specific things are that the management can be complex and really requires specialist sensors and MDT inputs um, unfortunately, we don't have as much evidence as we need. Uh, and I think moving forward, really looking at specific managements in the PCD setting uh, and whether we can target specific ultrastructural or genotype specific treatments, I think is really where the future is holding. And I'm going to be quiet now. So there you go. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. That's brilliant. Um, yeah, uh, I, again, it shows what a complex disease it is and that uh, why these um, talks are so important um, for us to all understand and, and learn a bit more. Um, even us experts who have lived with the disease for 20 odd years. So um, that's brilliant. So the next talk is um, Mikhail, 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 is that how you say your name? 
Alexandra, who's an ENT surgeon um, in, in, uh, in France, and she is in her third year of the fellowship at Vicentra Hospital in the ENT department. She's also a PhD student in the genetic department in Paris under the supervision of Dr. Legrand, and her PhD project consists of in identifying predisposing genetic factors involved in the pathophysiology of chronic rhinositis with nasal polyps, including PCD patients. So I'm sorry you had to wait a bit longer than you thought, but I we're really looking forward to hearing your talk now. So um, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'll try to share my presentation. There we go. There we are. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, and with the laser too. Uh, so thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, so yes, I'm Mihaela Alexandru. I work in the ENT department of BSET, and I'll talk to you today about ENT care for children and adults with PCD. So in France, there are uh, 37 PCD centers with only two ENT centers um, that are BSET Hospital, where we I uh, work, and Crete Hospital. Why upper airways are so important in PCD is because they are major criteria for PCD diagnosis. Uh, they are always involved with ear and sinus disease in the pathology because they impact air conditioning and audition. They have a major impact in quality of life. They may impact lung disease with not yet strong evidence, uh, and so they must be considered for optimal management. However, ENT symptoms are uh, underreported in the literature. Uh, clinical studies uh, focus more on the lower airways, and when there are ENT studies, they are more they are smaller, single center, mainly only on children and cross-sectional studies. Um, they uh, there, um, there is a lack of standardization of uh, ENT uh, disease and on the definitions and on the treatment. Uh, for instance, this um, study has been published uh, by Myrona in 2016, and it shows the high heterogeneity in uh, ENT uh, disease in sinusitis and in otitis. For instance, you can see that in some studies, there are very few sinusitis reported, and in other, there are many sinusitis reported in the same group of age. It's the same with otitis, with some patients having, um, some studies having very few uh, otitis reported, whereas all the studies reported in the same group of age, many otitis. Ear disease in uh, PCD is very frequent, as we said. Uh, it uh, is located especially in the middle ear, so between the eardrum that you can see here and the inner ear. So here uh, happens um, the otitis media with effusion that we will talk about uh, just after. So ear disease is at the forefront in children with PCD because they have multiple acute otitis media and uh, otitis media with effusion. It starts very early in uh, between one and two years. Uh, it um, is present in almost all, all of the children affected by PCD. And in, in more than two thirds of cases, there are many, many antibiotic courses. Um, before the diagnosis of PCD, uh, we uh, perform uh, multiple myringotomies or ventilation tube insertion. Uh, myringotomies is a small incision performed in the uh, eardrum to evacuate the liquid that is behind. Um, but unfortunately, uh, in uh, PCD, there is uh, complications that happen almost all the time after ventilation tube insertion or myringotomy, and it is ear discharge that you can see here or here. It can be very abundant and chronic, and uh, it can affect uh, the quality of life of patients. A study published in 2005 showed that uh, if we uh, perform conservative treatment, so without uh, ventilation tube insertion, uh, there is an improvement of audition with age, um, from adolescence especially. So there is a positive correlation between audition and age, and there is an, uh, uh, an improvement of hearing thresholds with age. 
but ear disease seems to remain in adulthood. A study published in 2019 showed that uh, in adult patients affected by PCD, um, there is a hearing loss reported in more than half of the patients. The audiogram, so the auditory test, is also abnormal in more than half of the patients. The otoscopic examination showed abnormal eardrum in 60% of cases. The abnormal eardrum could be otitis media with effusion, the little bulla that you can see behind the tympanic membrane. There can be myringosclerosis. Here is, uh, there are the white scars on the tympanic membrane, some retraction of the tympanic membrane, and sometimes a perforation of the tympanic membrane. A study that we published uh, quite recently, a few months ago, uh, showed the same results with abnormal otoscopic examination in 76% of patients. Uh, and uh, in the PCD uh, patients group, uh, there were more hearing loss reported than in the control group. Uh, we um, performed some temporal bones in the same study, temporal bone CT scans in the same studies, and uh, we reported that um, there were some mastoid condensations. So the temporal bone here uh, can be very, very condensated uh, in comparison with uh, patients non-affected by PCD. And these mastoid condensations happen in um, around 60% of cases. The tympanic membrane is also uh, thicker than in uh, patients without PCD. They have a very thin tympanic membrane here that you can see, whereas in um, PCD, there is a thick tympanic membrane. Uh, the last uh, results that I reported here is that the ossicular chain uh, can be damaged by the middle ear disease. For instance, uh, there can be an er erosion of the ossicular chain um, in around 30% of cases. So uh, the treatments of ear disease uh, in um, PCD, um, first of all, in children, uh, we it is suggested to avoid ventilation tube when possible, to perform nasal rinsing and sometimes to um, prescribe nasal corticosteroids to improve uh, the function of the eustachian tube uh, and to, um, to, to, to prescribe hearing aids uh, when uh, needed, when there is a hearing loss. Uh, in children, uh, we are very lucky in France because uh, we, can, uh, we can prescribe hearing aids in children for free till uh, 18 years old. Uh, for adults, it is important to continue a close ENT follow-up. Sometimes when there are ossicular damage, we can perform ear surgery and hearing aids are always a good option. For nasal disease, uh, in PCD, there are very few studies, even fewer studies than in uh, uh, autological uh, disease, uh, but um, nasal discharge is reported in around 76% of patients during the neonatal period. Uh, nasal symptoms are reported all the time during childhood, and uh, there, there can be uh, severe smell disorders that are reported only, unfortunately, only in one study, um, and uh, should, uh, there should be more studies about uh, the smell disorders. In adults, um, there are um, many uh, rhinological symptoms, such as uh, rhinorrhea. So the nasal secretions are uh, reported by more than 90% of patients, nasal obstruction in more than 60%, and facial pain in more than 50%. Uh, there, were, uh, there was an abnormal uh, rhinoscopic examination and otoscopy in uh, 98% of cases with uh, turbinate hypertrophy in 50% of cases, mucopurulent secretion in 30%, and nasal polyps happen in uh, one third of patients. But uh, in this study, there were no correlations between nasal disease and PCD type or lung function. Sinus CT scan uh, is uh, very frequently performed uh, in, uh, in the ENT uh, care of PCD patients because it can show that there are some de uh, sinus development defects uh, in around half 
uh, 50% of cases, there can be um, an agenesia. So you can see here an agenesia of the frontal sinuses, uh, hypoplasia of the sinuses, so uh, are more frequent. Here you can see hypoplasia of the maxillary sinuses and uh, sinus opacities are very frequent. They are consistent but incomplete, as you can see here. Uh, here are the etmoid uh, sinuses that are not completely um, uh, filled. The management of upper airways in PCD uh, should be, of course, multi oops, multidisciplinary. Um, we should perform therapeutic education uh, to explain uh, why, for instance, nasal rinsing is so important. Uh, surgery, I'll talk to you about that just after, uh, is uh, rarely uh, decided. Uh, and to date, there are no guidelines on the treatments of uh, on the ENT treatments, uh, of course. Um, if we perform surgery, it is important to do uh, thorough preparation of general anesthesia before. Uh, one study published in 2016 showed that uh, the that sinus surgery uh, could reduce uh, sinus bacterial reservoir. Uh, this study showed that, um, for instance, after sinus surgery, there were less uh, lung bacterial colonization. And uh, the other thing is that there, were an there was an improvement of the uh, SNOT22 score, which is a uh, quality of life uh, score uh, in patients um, uh, that uh, who had uh, sinus surgery. But uh, we uh, performed in a study uh, that is not yet published, uh, that was a retrospective comparative on 33 patients affected by PCD. Uh, 16 were operated, 17 were not operated. Uh, our follow-up uh, was very long, it was 15 years, um, and we didn't find a difference uh, in the quality of life of patients after who performed, who had surgery in comparison with the non-operated patients. Uh, we didn't find a difference between both groups uh, in the uh, nasal microbiology uh, or in the lung function after surgery or with no surgery. But uh, one thing was that patients who um, were in the operated group uh, had a later PCD diagnosis than patients that who were not operated. So there are many remaining questions, um, such as the markers, the ENT markers of the severity of the disease, for instance, uh, the evolution of the disease, like, like I, I told you, uh, the autological disease seems to um, be present in adulthood too. Uh, so what is this evolution of the disease in ENT? Uh, what is the impact of ENT disease on lungs? Uh, and uh, we should perform more studies to evaluate the efficiency of innovative uh, treatments. Uh, about outcomes, we need to perform more standardized uh, outcome for characterizing ENT disease, uh, for instance, giving a better definition of ENT exacerbation. And um, for this reason, we are part uh, of uh, the EPIC PCD study, uh, which is an international perspective uh, study, uh, which aims to uh, characterize ENT disease in patients with PCD and its association with lung disease and to identify determinants of its prognosis. Patients of all ages diagnosed with PCD who undergo ENT clinical assessment at least once a year in one of the um, participating um, uh, centers uh, are invited to participate. And I think the, 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 the numbers uh, changed, uh, were updated recently, but to date there are uh, 460 patients um, included in the study, almost 300 children and 160 adults. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you ever so much. That was really interesting and some really, really clear slides to show how the damage from PCD it was really good. And we hope that you continue to, to look into PCD as you further your career. Uh, this patient conference uh, today and for the, the kind um, introduction.
Um, so I was asked to talk about PCD treatments outside the norm. Um, and now I can't move my slides forward. Ah, there we go. Um, so things that have already been covered are the usual care um, of things such as uh, your ears and nose and throat, physiotherapy. I understand you've had sessions on transition and on mental health. And um, so in this talk, um, I, I was asked to talk about uh, during lung infections, um, so exacerbations, which has been covered a bit already. So I'll go over that fairly quickly. Um, also, what, what happens if you're having an operation? Um, I'll touch a bit on fertility, but I have to say I'm a paediatrician, so it's not my area of expertise, um, but I, I am aware of the literature and also about what, when you should have a, a cardiac assessment. So you've already seen this slide, um, it's slight, slightly different, it's uh, uh, the, 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 the same, same information. So this is the, the Coles um, circle or, or in this case ver vertex and what we're trying to highlight is that if you've got impaired muco mucus clearance, which you have in PCD um, down at the bottom, you're more likely to get infection. And this leads to inflammation, which eventually can lead to airway damage and bronchiectasis. And what we're trying to do with treatment is to prevent this cycle. We're trying to prevent damage setting in where we can't do anything to, to um, to improve it again. And to do that, as you've already heard, to um, we can't we can't make cilia work at the moment. One day we hope to um, with um, some some form of treatment, but at the moment we can't make the cilia work. So the only way, as the patient video showed, was for you to do airway clearance therapy. So um, physiotherapy methods and exercise. And that's going to reduce the chance of infection. But you're, it's still likely with PCD that from time to time um, you will get infections and eventually these might become chronic. And in that case, antibiotic therapy is necessary to prevent and reduce that inflammation and airway damage that can happen. And we know that exacerbations, so lung infections, um, are if you if you have lots of lots of infections, you're more likely to get um, uh, per that permanent damage at an, at an earlier age. And so it's important to, to treat infections. Um, you've already seen this um, slide, um, Susanna Crowley showed it to you, um, the, the consensus definition of what, um, what, what makes you think you might have an infection. And it tends to be an increased cough, a change in sputum volume or color, increased shortness of breath, um, a decision to change treatment. So your doctor might decide that you need to change treatment because of your, your symptoms or malaise or, or tiredness, lethargy. But the important thing to remember is, is that as, a, as patients, you're the one that can tell us most of these things. You need to know what your sputum usually looks like um, or you, you need to know if it's a young child that they then they're under the weather, they're not right, they're coughing more. So you you get, you get know yourself or your child and, and whether there's been a change. And that's what really what guides us as, um, as, as doctors as to whether you have an, a, an infection or not. We can do tests though that might help us um, decide. And we've already heard about taking sputum samples um, in, uh, in adults and older children. Um, that can usually be generated you, um, during a physiotherapy session. Um, but in younger children, we might need to use induced cough with suction or a cough swab. But it's important, as you've heard, that that sputum sample is sent before starting antibiotics so that we know what bugs are there. And we might do additional tests such as lung function, might do a chest X-ray or even a CT scan if we're having difficulty, um, difficulty treating the symptoms. And this is, this is again, just a representation of that. So the importance of getting that sputum sample sent off, then increasing your airway clearance and start doing that right from the start um, before antibiotics start even, um, start increasing your airway um, clearance um, as that, that might help 
reduce your chances of, of, um, of going on to get a, a severe infection. And then antibiotics, which might be orally by mouth or into a vein or nebulized. Our advice is that you should have a low threshold for using antibiotics. So if you've had increased symptoms for a few days, we would normally start patients on, um, on a 14 day course of antibiotics, which is longer than most people have. But because you have PCD, you need that extra time to clear the bacteria. If you're going into hospital for, for treatment of your infection, we suggest that you're segregated. So you're in a room by yourself away from other patients if possible. And certainly if, there, if you have pseudomonas or MRSA or other people on the ward do, you shouldn't be near them. It's important during, during exercise to keep up with physiotherapy and exercise if you can do, including if you're in hospital. In some ways, it's the worst place to be if you've got an infection because it can be very difficult to maintain your normal routines. Um, and we do a sputum test two to four weeks after treatment to make sure that the infection is cleared. One of the problems that a lot of patients say is, is that their doctor actually doesn't know much about PCD and so won't give the antibiotics um, or won't give the prolonged courses. And so if your doctor doesn't know much about PCD, it's important that you yourself become an expert and you educate them. And there are um, uh, consensus documents such as this one on the prevention and control of treatment of, of infections that you might be might like to download um, it's it's uh, it's free access to it, and you might need to give it to your doctors to educate them. If you're going into hospital for anything, for um, for surgery, for an operation, and are needing um, an anaesthetic, it's important that the anaesthetist knows. Um, it's important that um, unless it's emergency surgery, that you. Um, really uh, concentrate on your airway clearance and treating any infections in the few weeks prior to surgery and that before and after surgery you increase your physiotherapy um, and treat as I say treat any infections that might be be there but if you're an anaesthetist and surgeon know they can help you with that. Fertility has all already been mentioned and it might be um, that you need referral uh, for fertility advice um, we know that the cilia in the fallopian tubes, but actually there are also um, cilia in the in the uh, lining of the uterus or the or the womb in the glands there um, that might might have a role. Um, and it, in in men, it's the sperm where the sperm tail is very similar to um, the airway cilia structure. And because of that, it's about um, seventy percent, seventy five percent of men are thought to be. Um, infertile um, and about 40% of women may also have problems um, conceiving naturally. But if you get referred to a, a fertility expert, um, they may be able to help. Again, it's really important that you are in the best health when um, going, going for um, pregnancy and therefore treating infections and really making sure that your, um, your physiotherapy is um, uh, is is maintained, but it, it's it's fair to say that we're we're not we haven't got a lot of evidence for for treatments and and more more um, research is needed in this area. Um, as most of you will know, um, about half of people with uh, PCD have their organs on the opposite side. That doesn't cause any problems at all. Um, but there are about 10% of patients have um, isomerisms or congenital heart diseases um, not, not associated with our isomerisms. So isomerisms where um, it's, not, it's not in the normal position, it's not in the mirror image position, things are a bit muddled up. So about 10% of people with uh, PCD might have cardiac issues. And for that reason, whenever we um, diagnose patients with PCD, we ask the um, cardiologists to review them to, um, to check their heart to make sure that everything's normal. And as long as it is, there's no further worries, there's no need, further follow-up needed. Um, so management, um, it's already been mentioned, regular um, review by a um, multidisciplinary 
team with access to um, specialists for things such as fertility, audiology, genetics counselling, dietitians um, when, um, when, uh, when needed. Um, and annual reviews are, are what are recommended. Um, so with regular microbiology through the year and probably enhanced microbiology, so sputum samples um, in, once a year, chest x-rays we do once a year, but we also at the annual review will consider whether people need a, a CT scan. Um, we tend to do that once or twice during childhood, um, maybe more often during adulthood, and if we're having difficulties clearing um, lung disease. So with that, I'd just like to thank, um, I belong to a big team of people that are behind me um, uh, in Southampton, um, and I'd like to thank them, and I'd, I'd like to thank the organisers again for inviting me today. Thank you very much. Can you just conf can you just confirm if you can see my first slide? Yes, that's great. You can see it. Okay, and thank you very much for the invitation to talk to you um, about what it actually uh, means to be involved uh, in PCD research, and I think. Inherently in all of us, when we're approached to do anything from being the person that has to stack the dishwasher at Chris, after Christmas lunch or the person in class that's picked on to actually make a presentation or the person in clinic who's asked to be involved in PCD research, our first initial thought is, why me? And I have to encourage people in conditions like PCD to perhaps think direct, indirectly and say, well, why not? me. I think we all would agree that PCD is a unique condition in its own right, and so effective therapies must be designed through PCD experience and not translated from other conditions. So if you'll just allow me to I, I, uh, highlight why I feel this and how I feel this, this is a study that we were involved in about 16 years ago. This was the National Australian Trial of Hypertonic Saline in a group of patients who had cystic fibrosis, which again is an inherited progressive lung disease where the basic defect is difficulty in clearing mucus from the airways. And so over 12 months, half of the people involved in this study had hypertonic saline and half of the people had placebo. And at the end of the time, our conclusions at the study were that the use of hypertonic saline was a safe and effective additional therapy for patients with cystic fibrosis. And as a result of that, it's used widely not only in cystic fibrosis, but these findings were expanded to lots of other groups. So including PCD, and I'm sure many of you are aware of hypertonic saline in PCD therapy, but does it work in PCD? Well, there's only been one study of hypertonic saline in PCD, and this is from Dr. Harmon's group in the Netherlands. And at the end of their 12 week study, they concluded that inhaled hypertonic saline did not improve respiratory core in patients with PCD but that the sample size was small. And I think the, there are two very important points to actually uh, consider when we're looking at this conclusion. But before I do, I wanna very, very, very clearly say, I am not in any way telling people to stop the hypertonic saline that their doctors have prescribed. But this particular study didn't show the improvement that occurred in patients with cystic fibrosis. But maybe that's because it's a different condition. Maybe we need to use a different concentration. Maybe we need to take it more frequently. Maybe people with PCD need to inhale it through a different nebulizer. And we only know those answers when we study enough people with PCD. And sadly, this study, unfortunately, was unable to attract enough patients in to actually answer that question. Let's have a look at another example. This is a study we were involved in looking at structural lung disease in children with cystic fibrosis. These children had CT scans of their lungs at one year of age and three years of age. And our findings showed that there were significant structural changes in these children. The left lung was equally affected than the right lung. The upper parts of the lung were equally affected to the lower parts of the lung. But if you do the same study in people who have PCD, while you find that the right and left lung are equally affected, you find very clearly that the upper parts of the lungs are nowhere near as affected as the lower parts of the lung. And in fact, in our study, we found three unique structural changes in patients with PCD that have never been described 
in patients with cystic fibrosis, highlighting again the difference between these two conditions and the uniqueness of PCD. Now, anybody who's been involved with PCD will know very well the significant symptomatic load that occurs from the upper airway, from chronic nasal congestion to chronic runny nose, sinusitis, recurrent ear infections. It's a, an inherent tenant of having uh, um, being involved with PCD. What about cystic fibrosis? Well, this is the Australian Cystic Fibrosis Data Registry published only about a month ago, describing all the clinical features of the three and a half thousand people in Australia with cystic fibrosis. Here's the contents page. And if you look closely, there's nothing at all about the upper airway. So again, highlighting the difference and the uniqueness of PCD. And we, go, we can go on. We know that the difference in PCD where the cilia don't work is different to cystic fibrosis where the cilia do work and the challenge is in the actual structure of the mucus. Nearly 50% of people, of course, in PCD have situs issues. Nobody does in cystic fibrosis. And 90% of people in cystic fibrosis have a problem with malabsorption due to a pancreas that doesn't work, a defect that doesn't occur in PCD. So again, identifying that PCD is a very unique condition in its own right. And for us to identify new therapies in PCD that will benefit people with PCD, we need to study the people, we need to study people with PCD. So I assure you, you can make a difference in this way. But how can you be involved in research? I just thought let's just consider the types of research that are actually conducted. I divide them down initially into two types. There's investigator initiated research and pharmaceutical industry initiated research. So investigator initiated research is often descriptive. We might have a group of people in one particular centre, although I would say the European consortium are very good at actually uh, recruiting people from uh, different centres to work together to do these studies. They might consider sleep issues in PCD, X-ray changes in PCD, as we've already talked about, lung function changes, hearing issues, lots of other descriptive conditions. And many of these actually involve just consideration of the medical records without actually direct interaction with the patient. But even in those descriptive studies, all of them, even if they don't directly involve approach to patient, must have approval from an ethics committee from the health institution of the investigators. And in many cases, these researchers are classed as LNR, which means low or negligible risk to the actual person, the patient involved. But even with a low negligent risk, and I want to show you the process from my institution and assure you that pretty much every other institution will have a very similar process. For me to conduct a, patient, a study uh, in PCD, even if it's the x-ray study I talked about where we just looked at the x-rays, we have to fill out this particular page, which describes to the ethic committee all the things that we're going to do. On the second page, we have to put supportive documents, the protocol that we're going to use. In section four, you'll see before we get approval, our protocol has to be reviewed by another specialist who's not actually involved in the project. And that specialist has the right to say, this study is not going to answer the question uh, that's been postulated. This study isn't worth doing. This study is too dangerous for a, a, a patient to be involved in. Uh, it's too much of an effort for a patient to actually commit to actually being involved in it. And even the third one, we have to get supportive departments. We can't do x-ray studies unless we have approval from the x-ray department. We can't do studies on hearing problems in people with PCD without audiology. And until we've completed this entire program, this entire sheet, we can't even submit a formal ethics application to our ethics department. And when we do submit it, these are all the forms we have to fill out. And the ones I want to spend some time looking at, which are the most relevant ones for you, is the second and third one. And they're age dependent. It can either be a parent or guardian information for young children or a participant information uh, and consent form for people who are over the age of 12 and obviously adults. Now, we talked about descriptive investigator-initiated trials. There are then interventive investigator-initiated trials, and many of you may well be aware of the recent azithromycin study done throughout Europe in many of the PCD centres. 
We currently, as was mentioned in the introduction, are involved in what's called the repeat trial, which is a similar study looking at the role of azithromycin, but also an oral mucus breaking down drug called Erdostin. And for us to actually be uh, and recruit patients to this study, we have to fill out, as I talked before, a patient or parent information statement. And this is the one that we've had to use and develop in our research project. And I wanna to highlight to you this second paragraph, which is very important and should be included in any research that you are asked to be involved in. It says, taking part in this research project is voluntary. This means you can say no. Your child does not have to take part and you can withdraw your child from the project at any time without explanation. This will not affect their access to treatment options and care at the Royal Children's Hospital. And this last sentence is very important because many of our PCD patients form a very strong bond with their treating physician. And we don't want that bond to influence their decision and their ability to be able to say yes or no to be involved in a research trial if they're approached. And so certainly if any of my PCD patients uh, are eligible to be involved in a trial, I am not allowed to actually approach them for consent to be involved. Another investigator within the department approaches my patients and I will do similar approaches to the other investigators' approaches. So this is the front page of the information sheet, but it's a very detailed information sheet and it's essential that you understand everything in this information sheet before you ever consider giving consent to be involved in a trial. And in our information sheet, each of these questions comes with an explanation, which is done in plain language. So we have to, we're not allowed to hide behind very strong and technical medical terms. Has to be clear about what is this study about? What are the aims of the study? Who can be involved in the study? Do I have to be involved in this study? What will my child have to do if he or she is part of this study? What are the possible risks, side effects, or discomforts? And additionally, what are the benefits of this study? How do I withdraw from the study? What are the researcher's responsibility to me as a patient with PCD? What will happen to the information collected? Will my name and home address be published in medical literature that everybody can access? Has this uh, research project received ethical approval from a, a, an ethics company? If I have questions, who do I contact to actually find more about the trial? And what if I'm unhappy about the trial? Well, if I'm unhappy, there has to be a person that I can contact as well. All of this needs to be clearly set out and if you're going to be involved in a research project, you have to understand all of this before you ever give consent to be involved in a trial. Now, pharmaceutical companies have actively been involved in development of new therapies for many, many years. And really they are essential. Although that times get very bad press by maybe producing very effective drugs and then charging exorbitant prices for insurance companies and governments to actually fund them. It is important to recognize that um, significant progress in uh, therapies for people with conditions such as PCD require these pharmaceutical companies to make the commitment to make a difference. I wanna run you through this graph, which on the horizontal axis shows the calendar years and on the vertical axis, the survival level of patients with cystic fibrosis right from the start in 1940, where the disease was first recognized. And you can see over the years that survival has dramatically increased. And this is due in a large part to the development by pharmaceutical companies of these very effective new therapies. But I think when we're looking at these new therapies, we can divide them down into two. If you look below the red line, you've got uh, advances such as inhaled tobramycin, an antibiotic that's very effective against pseudomonas, a bug that we worry about there are significant advances and improvements in lung transplant. There are other anti-pseudomonal antibiotics and also effective anti-staphylococcal antibiotics that pharmaceutical companies have strongly been involved in the development of. But I think most of those uh, advances, important as they are, are really what I would call Band-Aid research or Band-Aid approaches, because you only get the benefit of inhaled tobramycin if you've actually got pseudomonas lung disease, you only get the benefit of the newly improved surgical lung transplant procedures 
if your lung disease is so severe that you need a lung transplant. And similarly, you only get the benefit from the new anti-pseudomonal or new anti-staph antibiotics if your lungs are challenged by these particular bugs. So these essentially are all complications of the underlying disease. And the ideal thing for pharmaceutical companies to develop would be drugs which actually inherently correct the underlying defect of the condition, such as PCD, such as cystic fibrosis. And in cystic fibrosis over the last 10 years or so, the companies have developed these compounds. These names aren't important, but each of these are now readily available in populations of people with cystic fibrosis, and they are game changers. They are literally lifesavers. But what you can class them as are disease-modifying uh, agents. You don't have to have the complication of the disease. These agents, and all of these are oral preparations, will actually directly correct the cellular defect in CF to make it a cell that does not have the CF characteristic. And the importance in research is that all of these studies are being conducted in people with, with CF. And so when such medications become available to study in PCD, they require with people with PCD to be involved. And I think what is really important to understand is that while it's taken 10 to 20 years to develop these drugs in cystic fibrosis, they're not going to take as long to develop in PCD because the development of these drugs for cystic fibrosis required the identification and the development of very refined laboratory techniques which identify which particular molecules might work and how to actually test them. We now have all those techniques and they're translatable from cystic fibrosis to lots and lots of other conditions, in particular PCD, and those steps are already underway. So there are new therapies, these new investigational tools are being used to identify new therapies in people in P with PCD, which will actually, hopefully, directly improve uh, and correct the underlying defect in PCD rather than correct any complications such as a nasty infection. In order for any investigator to be involved in a drug trial and therefore be involved in experimenting with patients with these trials, they are required to have active uh, good clinical practice training or GCP training. And you won't get ethical approval from your ethics institution unless you can prove that the investigators running these trials at your institution are licensed in GCP. And GCP training covers all aspects of training. How do you safely design a study for patients with PCD? How do you conduct a study for patients with PCD? How do you monitor it? How do you record the results? How do you analyze the results? And how do you report it? And the basic and most important tenet of this GCP is that the rights, the safety, and the well being of trial subjects are the most important considerations and should prevail over the interests of science and society. So, as investigators uh, involved in PCD, I'm very excited about what the future holds over the next five to 10 years. I think Big Pharma will certainly be able to provide us with some very exciting advances, but it does require a relationship and interaction between not only investigators, but people and uh, with PCD and groups of, of support people with PCD. So I hope my talk can give you some confidence that we are very committed to not only making these changes and improving the, the lives and quality of life of people with PCD, but in doing so, respecting the rights and the health and the safety of patients with PCD as well. Thank, thank you. you. I think I'll stop there. Yes, thank you very much, Phil, for giving this brilliant um, overview of research and ethical considerations in patients with PCD. I think the, the ethical issues you highlighted are extremely important, and, and your talk gives room for optimism in terms of timescale, perhaps, and um, the development of new PCD-related therapies. I just have one question, because we have another half-hour session before we have an open question time. Are you able, I know it's very late for you, but are you able to wait half an hour and then take questions directly? Is that possible? Sure, I can do that. Oh, yep, that's brilliant. That's Thank you so much. Thanks.
Thank you, Phil. Thank you. And particularly as it's in the middle of the night, I hope you've got a big glass of wine with you to uh, to keep you awake for the next half an hour. Um, I'm just can... going to go pour myself one, actually. Jolly good. <laughs> no, but then you'll fall asleep. <laughs> Say yeah, cheers no, I'll to be me. awake. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, so what we're going to do now is just talk about how PCD care is set up in, in different countries. And there's going to be a short talk from me and Sandra in Spain and Penelope in Cyprus. So I think I'm going to kick off. So if I can share my screen. Um, here we go. Hopefully you can all see that. OK, uh, right. So, um, yeah, so I'm going to talk to you about the, the service in um, in the UK. And I think Jane and um, and Anna, Anna this morning have talked a little bit about what they do. So I won't I'll click on a little bit on about that, but I'll tell you about how it was set up. But I thought it might be useful for you to see what my PCD credentials were um, and then why I'm kind of like, a, you know, uh, have got the, the credentials to talk to you about this. So firstly, my parent of two sons who have PCD. And you can see from this picture that they're both doing really well. And they're now adults. Um, we joined the PCD support group in 2001, just after they'd been diagnosed. And I became the chair in 2003. And I volunteered for that uh, for the charity for 17 years. Um, and in those 17 years, I worked really closely with the condition the cl clinicians to improve the services for patients with PCD. Um, so our PCD service, we were, our service is funded by our National Health Service and it's free to everyone. And our diagnostic service was established in 2006, our management service in 2012, and then the adult service in 2019. And all patients can now access these, uh, these diagnostic service for nasal brushings and genetic screening from the three centres in the UK. And then once diagnosed, they're regularly seen in, in clinics uh, where they're seen by the specialist and multidisciplinary teams, which Jane and Alan talked to you about this morning. So the respiratory consultant, EMT consultant, specialist nurses, physiotherapist, or oh, I've lost my pages there, sorry, um, physiotherapist, um, physiologists, um, and then they'll get an annual review. Um, but how did we do these? These So these services were developed because the patients were demanding better care and an early diagnosis. And when my kids were born, we were lucky. We were seen by a doctor who had seen PCD before and worked at the Royal Brompton. And, and we were seen there and the boys were tested in a research lab. And it quickly came apparent to me that this service was needed for all children and adults to access. And yesterday we had a lot of talkers about people saying you've got to find an expert who understands the disease. And, and even Phil has just been saying it's very different to cystic fibrosis. So we started with the diagnostic service, asking our pa patients what they wanted and gathering evidence on why a service was needed. And then we helped with the clinicians publish the PCD guidelines, management guidelines, all things that demonstrated the need for extra funding for this patient cohort. And then we asked the patients what they wanted. And then and we asked them things like, would you be happy to go be traveling to get a tested to see an expert in PCD? And they all said yes, irrespective of where they lived. People wanted to see someone that knew something about PCD and it could genuinely help yeah. themselves or their children. And then also then we networked a lot and we asked patient, pe people from all around the world, people like Suzanne, to say, you know, do you think this is a good idea? And they all backed this service. And then we took all that information to our, our NHS um, um, and to, to get these services commissioned. It, it didn't happen overnight. Uh, it was a really long process and, and a lot of effort went into it from everybody involved. But, but we proved so. We also asked people like there was evidence to say that some patients were being not being diagnosed or they were being diagnosed and they were being treated in cystic fibrosis clinics and not getting the, the correct treatment. So they were given Creon, which is something to work on your pancreas, and then they didn't have pancreatic disease. So, so that's dangerous when things like that happen. So this was a real good reason for us to show that our, this, this, this um, service was required. Um, so why why do we have these specialist benefit uh, centers? Well, there's multiple benefits for having these centers. Um, everybody gets the same care. Everybody gets the same test. We're able to audit and quality control the care that patients get. Sharing the centers share their experiences. If they have a patient that they're not man they can't manage or they're finding it difficult to get them well, they compare notes, um, and that is really useful um, uh, that we have this combined resource. 
it also means that the, the patients can still remain part of this thing and they can continue to make sure that, that the service remains well and, and good. Um, I mean, our service is new, the adult service is new. It, it came into fruition in the pandemic. There's still a lot of work to be done to make it ex, you know, excellent. It's good and it's better than not having anything at all, but it's still a long way to, to, to make sure that it remains good. Um, and, be, and us as patient advocates are making sure that that happens. Um, but there's so many benefits of having it. We, we're able to succession plan. So, so Jane Lucas has worked in, in PCD for a number of years now, and, and there'll be people coming underneath that she is showing enthusiasm for the field to make sure that people will continue to carry on this great work. Um, and it allows us also to do research on these patients because they're all seen in the same centres and we can start to say, we've got this piece of research, would you like to join in? So this is how our services is developed. I have literally flown through that because make sure that we we run on time. So, um, and I'm sure people have questions. So let me stop sharing my slide and then I'll ask Sandra whether you can show yours and tell us about your service in Spain. Yeah. Hello. Thank you very much. Hello, good afternoon. I try to. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Good afternoon to everybody. Thank you for you for your invitation to share our experience as a PCD center in in Spain. I'm Dr. Sandra Rovira, pediatric pulmonologist of Vallebron Hospital in in Barcelona. In Spain, there are two centers, Barcelona and Valencia, where the majority of the diagnostic tests for PCD are performed. But in some hospitals, the patients are diagnosed, for example, only by genetics or by, or by TEM. However, PCD patients are follow up in every, in every one of most of the hospitals of Spain. Um, and my talk, I will talk about how and when PCD care was set up in, in our hospital, in Vallebron Hospital. Before 2010, the only way to study patients in our city um, with the suspicion of PCD was by electron microscopy in other hospital in Barcelona. But in 2010, we received a grant that led us to go to Leicester to learn about high-speed video microscopy and cell cultures. Moreover, we could uh, acquire a high-speed camera. Since then, we are using a high-speed video microscopy for a diagnostic. And our incorporation to cost action with PCD and Erlang was very important to collaborate in the network to improve our diagnostic tools. So in, in 2016, we got a grant to design our first gene panel with 40 genes. Since then, we study genetics in high suspicion patients. And in, in 2017, we got another grant to learn about immunofluorescence to incorporate this tool in our daily diagnostic routine. Uh, Excuse me a I, moment, Sandra, just, yeah. just to interrupt you for a moment. Did you know that your slides are not moving? Ah, no, for me are moving. Oh, okay, they're, they're not moving for us, they're still mm -hmm. on the first page? Yes. I come back to the first page, but um, did you start? Can you press start slideshow? Yes. I will try to share again. What? Now you can see, isn't it? Yes. Yes. We can and see the first. I, yes, the first. Okay. Um, Now I can pass to the other. Did you press start yes. slideshow yes, up it, on the? Yes, it's 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 not post. It's it's share. Present share. Um. Okay. <laughs> in this slide, I I try to say that there are two centers in Spain. I will resume this part, and then I I will follow with the uh, with my last. Uh, a slide that I, I was talking about because I, I could see it before. Okay, this is the, the two centers of Spain where the, the majority of the, the tests um, can be performed and the, and the PCD patients are follow up in, in all Spain hospitals. 
this is the, the third slide when I try to say that uh, that explain that we have a grant to learn about high speed video microscopy and cell culture. And, and then we achieve a, a high speed camera. And since then we are using high speed video microscopy for diagnosis. And, and in this slide, um, I was saying that that the bit, that our incorporation in BitPCD group and ERN Lang was very important for us to collaborate um, in the network to improve the, uh, our diagnostic tools. We obtained a grant in 2016 um, to design our first gene panel, and then we are using genetic studies in high suspicion patients. And in, in, 19, in 2017, we got a grant to learn about immunofluorescence and incorporate uh, this tool in our uh, daily diagnostic uh, routine. And a uh, science of our lab went to Munster and the science of Leicester came to our lab to share experience with these grants. And, and in 2021, we received another grant to design the gene panel with more genes and we are carrying out a multicenter, a multicentric study. Um, our uh, hospital as a diagnostic center is funding by research and grants. Uh, we study patients of Catalonia and receive samples and patients from other Sp Spanish areas. Uh, the PCD team in Vallebron Research Institute is composed by two scientists to perform um, high-speed video microscopy, immunofluorescence and genetic studies, and one physician to perform high-speed video microscopy. Our, as a diagnostic tools, we have NASA nasal nitric oxide, high-speed video microscopy, immunofluorescence, genetics, uh, studying by gene panel or exome in some cases, but um, them is not available. Uh, every week we have meetings to discuss PCD diagnostic cases. Our hospital as a center for following up uh, PCD patients is part of national health system. We follow patients of our reference area and PCD uh, pediatric team is composed by uh, pediatric pulmonologists, nurses, INTs, uh, physiotherapists, and in some cases, nutritionists, psychologists, and cardiologists, depend on the, of the case. And this year, our hospital has been working on the transition program uh, for all diseases, also PCD. This program includes patient training and competence since 12, uh, 14 years old, clinical meetings every one, two months, and clinical visits together, pediatrics and, and adults doctors. The PCD adult team has similar structure than pediatric team. Also other specialists as fertility specialists, gynecologists are included. So I only, to, I only want to say thank you to all members of PCD teams and the grants, the projects that make possible to be a, a referral center in Spain for diagnosis and to take care of, of our patients. Fiona, you're muted. I'm Sorry, I'm, yes, it's late on a first Saturday afternoon for me. It's not as late for everyone in Australia. Thank you very much, Chandra, for, um, for telling us about your service and how it's developing. And that's really great. And um, we look forward to seeing how you take it forward. And uh, now I'm going to hand over to Penelope in, uh, in Cyprus. I'm not even going to try and say your name. So please tell us what your name is so that I don't make a real mess of it. So nice, yeah, to, no, nice to see you. Thank okay, you. hello everybody. My <laughs> name is Penelope Anagnostopoulou. I'm a pediatric pulmonologist in Cyprus. And um, I'm going to tell you a few things about the PCD service in Cyprus. Um, just let me know if you can see my slides. And if they are moving also. Could you see that? It's coming, yeah. It's coming, yeah. And now you need to stick it into presentation yeah. mode yeah perfect thank you so very I much hope this is okay yeah hopefully it'll move this time yeah <laughs> thanks 
Very well. So I'm going to start a bit more general because uh, you may well know uh, UK and Spain, but you may don't know where Cyprus is. Uh, so here's the map of Europe uh, during night from a satellite. So Cyprus is here actually uh, in the um, uh, in the very uh, yeah. So you, you can see that now, and um, this is uh, schematically in a map. So you can see that uh, it is in the very eastern part of uh, Europe, uh, very close to Turkey and uh, also close to um, Israel, Egypt and other countries. Uh, so uh, Cyprus uh, is actually the third largest Mediterranean island and it uh, has about 1.2 million inhabitants. And uh, actually it's famous for several things. First of all, um, it's famous from mythology because it's uh, called the birthplace of Venus. And uh, you can see here, the, I don't know if you can see my pointer. Um, so you can see the, the place that um, it is uh, supposed to be the birthplace of Venus. Uh, so it's a place with magnificent, magnificent beaches, natural beauty, historical monuments, a lot of them, and great hospitality great people also. So you're very welcome to visit us. Now it's about 20 degrees, uh, uh, sunny outside. So it's very nice uh, to visit us also during winter. But also Cyprus is famous for something else. It's famous for the high prevalence in genetic disorders. Of course, it's an island. And in former times, it was an island that was quite isolated from other uh, populations. Uh, so um, now we know that we have a high prevalence in thalassemias. Uh, here you can see in this uh, picture the high prevalence of carriers of beta thalassemia in Cyprus compared to other Mediterranean countries. Also, we see a lot of hereditary nephropathies, renal diseases, and some neurological disorders. So what about PCD? Uh, we do have a high prevalence of PCD as well. It seems that we have 56 patients diagnosed in Cyprus at the moment, which is quite um, um, high uh, incidence, um, considering that this is a rare disease. Um, so I'm going to uh, present you a few things about the PCD service. And first, I'm going to uh, start with a brief history of this service. Um, in the early 90s, we identified the first PCD cases in the island. And um, at that time, two brilliant uh, scientists, one medical doctor and one biologist, thought that uh, there is a need to uh, have some infrastructure to diagnose um, more patients because it was um, it, they, they saw the necessity for that. So they established uh, the electron microscopy infrastructure in 93 uh, in uh, the Cyprus uh, Institute of Genetics and uh, Neurology. And uh, then on 95, they established the nasal NO infrastructure in the Archbishop of uh, Macarius Hospital. At the 1997, uh, there was a, a, the establishment of the outpatient clinic for pediatric pulmonology. Uh, in the same hospital. So at that time, it was official that they could see and follow clinically the patients there. And uh, afterwards, um, they established the, the uh, high-speed video microscopy. Uh, on 2009, they got a uh, donation from uh, the Breathing Life Trust. So a uh, whole lung function laboratory was um, established in the clinic. And on 2017, there was a collaboration with the medical school of the University of Cyprus. And this comes now to um, um, the PCD service uh, in Cyprus as we have it right now, it, which is a network of three different uh, institutions. As you can see, it's the hospital that I mentioned before. It's the Cyprus Institute of Neurology and Genetics and the medical school. And I'm going to explain you the role of each one of those institutions uh, briefly. So the Pediatric Pulmonology Clinic is the only tertiary center in the country for children with uh, chronic lung diseases. We offer the clinical services there, a lung function laboratory. Uh, it is the national center for patients with CF and PCD for children and adults. I will mention afterwards um, something about that. It offers educational and research activities and it is ISO certified. Uh, 
So uh, about the clinical service, we um, perform the clinical assessment and the follow-up of the patients. We perform the lung function testi testing. We perform the nasal biopsies. If needed, flexible bronchoscopy. And also we train the uh, students of the medical school at the University of Cyprus. Uh, the staff consists of uh, two pediatric pulmonologists, pulmonologists, one pediatrician with special interest in pediatric pulmonology, one nurse specialist, and one other nurse and an office support. The lung function laboratory that we have offers spirometry, nitric oxide, nasal for uh, those with high suspicion of PCD and bronchial NO, the multiple breath washout, which is something that you may know, it is uh, another technique that we use quite regularly at the moment to see the function of the small airways because spirometry shows us only the function of the big airways. We um, uh, do sleep studies if this is needed. And very recently we acquired the forced oscillation technique uh, device and an electrical impedance tomography. The first one is to measure the specific resistance of the airways and the electrical impedance tomography uh, is a very uh, new technique that shows the uh, distribution of ventilation in the lungs, which is something that you can see here with one of our young patients. The same patient is performing the multiple breath washout. So regarding the clinical service uh, in our country, we have a shared care approach. So we are not alone in this uh, uh, clinical assessment. We have to collaborate with many uh, colleagues, um, uh, either uh, medical doctors or other um, uh, uh, people that work in the uh, health uh, uh, service. Uh, so we perform the follow-up of our patients every two to six months with a clinical assessment, with somatometrics, lung function testing, mostly oximetry, spirometry, and multiple breath washout, and microbiology. Uh, in the meantime, we uh, collaborate for this with the pediatricians for the children and the general practitioners for the adults. Uh, for the adult uh, patients, we have a very close collaboration with the adult pulmonologists. Uh, we uh, um, regularly um, see the patients together with the ENT specialist. Radiologists and microbiologists are always involved when needed. Other specialties like the gynecologist, the cardiologist, or the pediatric cardiologist, endocrinologist, neurologist, etc. And we always see our patients together with a respiratory therapist, a dietitian, and a psychologist. So when there is a need for hospitalization, our children uh, patients will go to the pediatric ward of the hospital. The adult patients will be hospitalized in pulmonology clinics, mostly in the state hospitals, some of them in private hospitals if needed. And we also perform a year follow-up for each patient once per year. And the board in this case consists of the pediatric pulmonologists, an adult pulmonologist, an ENT specialist, other specialties if needed, and a respiratory therapist and a dietitian. So the next uh, um, institution, as I told you, is the Institute of Neurology and Genetics. And here we perform the genetics for the patients with PCD and the electron microscopy. We also perform genetics and sweat tests for CF, which is, be belongs to the initial assessment of those with high suspicion of the disease. Uh, it also offers educational services and research services. Um, this consists of two senior biologists, one molecular geneticist, and one biologist. And the next, um, the last institution that takes part in this uh, network is the um, uh, medical school with the respiratory physiology lab and the cell and developmental biology. Uh, lab. Here we perform the high-speed video microscopy and the cell cultures. Uh, we offer also educational activities and research activities. And also um, a member of the Respiratory Physiology Laboratory, it does all the administrative work for the PCD Center, cons uh, consisting of the patient's registry, the information for patients, uh, the uh, communication with patients, etc. This consists of uh, three academics, one senior biologist and one biologist. 
So uh, we uh, participate in the European network. This is actually uh, since the beginning of this uh, uh, big uh, European network uh, collaboration from 2010. Uh, we participated in the Bacillia. Uh, we um, uh, feed the uh, registries with the data uh, of our patients. Uh, we uh, were um, actively uh, participating in the BID PCD. And uh, since 2019, uh, we are a member at the ERN LANG, the BCD core. Uh, from, for two years, from 19 to 21, we were an affiliated member. And um, since the beginning of this year, we are a full member of this uh, consortium. Uh, we also uh, take part and lead several research projects. I'm not going to bother you a lot about this, but maybe you know two research projects that are ongoing at the moment. One about uh, um, the familial concordance in PCD. So uh, we collect uh, um, uh, siblings uh, with uh, PCD and uh, uh, collect their data. And the other is about the exacerbations uh, in patients with PCD. So maybe some of you uh, take part in those studies. So uh, an important uh, issue for us is the collaboration with the patient's organization. Here you see uh, the Breathing Together, which is uh, um, dedicated to PCD, but we also collaborate with other um, um, organizations uh, that have to do with PCD somehow, and their um, work is uh, incredible at the moment, so we are very happy to have them with us. We participate in information days, and uh, uh, we uh, lastly started having uh, uh, outreach uh, diagnostic services, uh, which means we collaborate with some centers in Greece and we go there to collect specimens from patients uh, with high um, suspicion for PCD. We bring the uh, specimens back to Cyprus, we work the specimens here and we make the diagnosis. Um, the last thing that I want to say is that uh, for us, the opinion uh, of the patients really matters. And we started a pilot study on 19 uh, with a satisfaction questionnaire. Uh, these are the results here. So you see several um, uh, issues that uh, were important for us. So we wanted to ask our patients uh, uh, about their opinion on those issues. The study is ongoing at the moment. Uh, we are uh, going to analyze the data of 20 and 21 together due to the pandemics. Uh, we didn't have um, uh, so many data and uh, we hope that uh, they will look better and better and we try to um, become better every year. So that's all from my side. Uh, uh, here you can see all the uh, collaborators in this um, uh, service. We really thank our patients and their families for the collaboration and I thank you also for your attention.